to Six Strings and Things, a guitar adventure. The place for all things guitar and gear. Here are your hosts, Chris, Jesse, and Robert. Welcome to Six Strings and Things, a guitar adventure, your fortnightly webcast for all things guitar and gear. I'm Chris. With me tonight is Jesse. Hello. And not with us tonight, again, is Robert. Robert. I think they're working him too hard at the job. I think you're right. He's missing yeah. action. Yeah. He's like gone incommunicado. It's like a lost episode or a season 10 or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking more of that song, you know, that uh, pushing 16 tons and what do you get? <laughs> <laughs> right. He owes his soul to the company store. <laughs> All right, well, let's go ahead and get on with this. Uh, we'll poke fun at Robert along the way. All right, so what have you been working on this week, Jesse? So um, mostly the Iron Man solo from Black Sabbath, the classic tune from, well, whenever that was, 71, 70? I don't remember. But anyway, um, yeah, so my guitar student wanted to learn that, um, and uh, so I've been kind of picking it up to show her, and uh, it's a cool blues box in C, mi or C sharp minor, and... It's good, mostly. There's a little bit of things that go outside of that, but it's a good solo. And then a little bit of jamming to some Stevie Ray Vaughan um, stuff online, YouTube. Woo! Cool. <laughs> yeah, I the I know all of Iron Man but the solo. And so earlier this summer, I was like, that's going to be my project this summer, is to learn that solo. Uh, and I have a tab book for it and everything, and I was going to really have at it. And I sat down, listened to the solo. I'm like, damn, this is kind of hard. And then I started working <laughs> through the, the tab book. And I think I got like maybe maybe three bars in. I'm like, I'm going after some lower hanging fruit. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I actually started Iron Man. It was like my first year playing. And I knew certainly the solo was well out of my reach for a first year player, for sure. Yeah. Uh, I, th I think, though, I could probably start to seriously tackle that solo if I oh, just yeah. committed myself to it. I think so. I mean, the, the two hardest, there's like, uh, I think two or three re repeated licks in there that he does, like just basic sort of blues repeated licks that he does like you know, three or four times each. Mm -hmm. Once you get them under your fingers and then you get the transitions, I think the rest is pretty, yeah. So yeah, you could do it. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I mean, I've gone through the um, Nativity in Black solo mm -hmm. and uh, not the recording speed, but I worked through it. This was a couple of years ago. And mm -hmm. then also, um, Paranoid, which is my favorite Black Sabbath song of all time. Yeah. Gotta love it. Yeah, that's the first, I was like, that was the first song I wanted to learn. But of course it was, um, oh boy, Breaking the Law. Oh yeah. Yeah. You know, I, you gotta start, you gotta start somewhere. It's uh, true. Yeah. This week I've been working on uh, blues rhythm and blues lead, um, working on the 12 bar progression, but adding, you know, ninth chords in there and 13th chords in there and sort of just trying to get them, like you said, under my fingers mm -hmm. uh, the chord transitions and all of these things. Some, some of them are kind of funky and just need to get a better grip of them. Seventh chords. I've, I've had a good feel for your basic E and A shaped seventh chords, right. but there's a new fingering of a seventh chord that I've been learning. And uh, so working on that. And then of course lead just trying to build up a lick library and learning how to, play um lead without sounding like eighth notes all the time which <laughs> seems like what i gravitate to uh and then on top of all that uh i've been working on some technique development so my instructor and i decided that uh i need to work on technique um to help get me better instead of just learning you know song after song after song after song let's learn sure. about you know if i'm if I'm someplace on the neck, you know, where's my closest A chord or where's my closest C chord or whatever the right. case might be. And um, so he's giving me some exercises, which I'll have to show you sometime. Uh, you probably already know them, but uh, to um, sort of start to establish that chord sense around the fretboard. I have a fairly decent note sense. I kind of know where the notes are, especially on the A uh, e, A and D strings. I'm starting mm -hmm. to really starting to absorb the B, G and E strings. Um, and there's notes, but, uh, yeah. So just trying to get a sense of that. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Technique is good. I mean, it kind of, it takes a long time to get to the technique level you want to be yeah. because we all want to be, well, name your favorite hot guitar player in whatever genre you listen to, you know? <laughs> and, uh, it just takes a long time to, to, uh, hone your technique to that level. Yeah. 
No, absolutely. And so I know this is not going to be like a, oh, wow, after this week, I see him so much better at X. You know, right. it's going to be months. It's months <laughs> in. But, you know, um, like I told my uh, my guitar instructor, a person doesn't get a Ph.D. in theoretical physics by shying away from boring, plain stuff. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> You don't you don't get uh, where you want to be on guitar from shying away from scales and arpeggios, right. and, you know. That's right. So I'm used to I'm used to putting the nose to the grindstone and, and, and hacking away. So I, I'm looking forward to this, even if it's not going to be the most exciting stuff in the world. And the fact is, you know, I mean, you've come a long way, you know, in the few years that I've known you as a guitar player. I mean, Thanks. you know, you've really come a long way, which is is great. I don't think I progressed that fast when I was, you know, first learning. Of course, you have the advantage. You have the YouTubes and the yep. uh, interwebs and, you know, um, all the tablature and everything that was um, just kind of, well, tablature was sort of just coming in, you know, when I was learning. But, um, boy, the, the Internet is is quite a tool. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, absolutely. You know, I've got to, and this is a little off topic, but what the hell. Um, my dad's wife was telling me that when she was younger – she wanted to learn how to play piano. Mm -hmm. And so the, she didn't know how to read music. Mm -hmm. So what she would do is listen to the songs, find the keys that she, that, you know, she needed to press and then label the keys. All right. And so she essentially established, you know, tablature for piano for herself. Right. And that's how she figured out how to play the songs that she knew how to play. I thought that was pretty cool. That is cool. Yeah. yeah. Cause we I don't think do I'll, yeah, you know, and they have tools like that sort of for guitar. Like, I don't know if you've seen like the uh, the fretboard like stickers with the note names. Oh, yes. Yeah. yeah, and, yeah. and they have like the fret light where it actually has like LEDs embedded in the in the, uh, the fretboard. So it lights up in the various patterns or whatever. But at some point, you know, they're crutches. <laughs> you right. have to move right. on anyway. So right. I think it's best probably just start with the patterns, get them under your fingers, etc. Yeah. I think you might be right on that for sure. Um, all right, let's uh, go ahead and introduce our new segment that you came up with. Uh, this fortnight in guitar history, where we'll talk <laughs> about, I love the name, where we'll talk about uh, things that happen in and around this fortnight uh, in guitar history. So why don't you go ahead and get started? Sweet. Well, I picked out three. Of course, there's a ton of these that you could, uh, uh, you could find. And, you know, we're certainly open if you want to... Um, you know, tweet us or I email us or, or respond on YouTube uh, and give us your thoughts on what the most important things are. Um, the ones I picked were uh, August 18th, 1980 was uh, the day Back in Black was released by ACDC. Um, a seminal guitar album. <laughs> this thing is, I mean, talk about three chord, like just raw rock and roll with blues based. I mean, they are the quintessential band for that. Um, yeah. And in fact, it's funny because I wasn't really a big ACDC fan back in the day, but I became kind of one after that. And you kind of have to like at least some ACDC songs. <laughs> Absolutely. If you play guitar, you have to like at least some because most people who pick up guitar, I mean, I shouldn't say most, but many people who pick up guitar pick up the guitar because they want to sound like something. And when you hear ACDC, it's almost impossible to say, I, I don't want to sound like that. Right. right? I think everybody <laughs> wants to sound like, you know, back in black at some point in their life or absolutely all night long. Hell's bells. That's on that album too. Right. Yep. All three. Yeah. Those yeah. are the, actually, those are the classic songs, you know, that are overplayed. If you listen to, you know, classic rock radio, Sure. Um, maybe if you, <laughs> maybe you think that, um, <laughs> if you don't know those songs or haven't heard the songs, listeners go YouTube them because and get a quick lesson in ACDC and then you'll yeah. be buying albums, you know? <laughs> oh, absolutely. Yeah. And, and you have to buy the, album. I don't think they're available on iTunes. Oh, really? I think I, I could be wrong about that, but there was one point where they weren't available on iTunes. That's fascinating. Yeah. Luckily, I have the CDs, so I'm good. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Get it on CD. Get the better sound quality. You're, it's true. You're, you're a guitar player, okay? You want right. to listen to real music. Of course, there's some people out there saying, well, if you want to real music, you get the vinyl version, right? And uh, Well, they're wrong, but, <laughs> but you do no. need the best digital quality of uh, Brian Johnson's, you know, I don't know, whiskey-soaked vocals. <laughs> right. <laughs> and Angus's screaming distorted amps. I mean, there's no way to hear abject distortion in a cleaner way. 
<laughs> most definitely unless of course you're listening to wax cylinder because we all know that has the best fidelity sound absolutely uh, you know, right gotta go back to wax cylinder um yeah so back in black uh, if you're listening to this podcast you had to have heard black and black but you have it <laughs> do yourself a favor get a copy of the album buy the album support this poor band and uh <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> they're struggling <laughs> right and they play it so loud that the neighbors complain or your parents complain if you still live with your parents uh, and until play- you do so don't let anybody know that you've never heard the song <laughs> oh, absolutely yeah it's like admitting you haven't seen star wars you know, and, you know of, don't yeah. tell anybody yeah yeah just, right. just go listen to it. and then the next time you you know you come if you come across someone who hasn't heard the acdc before you can be like i can't believe you haven't heard acdc you know? seriously here listen to this <laughs> right right Get schooled. Okay, so the second uh, date that I have is August 27th, uh, 1990, and that was the day Stevie Ray Vaughan was killed in a helicopter crash, which um, these things are always sad, you know, when, uh, I don't know, you hear these stories. Of course, musicians sometimes die of nefarious things, too. (laughs) Um, But like the plane crash, it took Buddy Holly, and um, car crashes, it took various people, and, and this one, and the well, I'm sure in March 19th, we're going to talk about Randy Rhodes playing crash as well. But anyway, um, yeah. So Stevie Ray had, uh, had a first, the first couple albums were awesome. Um, this, the next couple were, he kind of slid a little bit, had some dependency issues. And then he came back in a big way. Um, good live album. Um, in step came out. It was a great album. And then he was gone, you know? So, um, that's one of the reasons I was kind of jamming this week to some of his stuff and listening to some live uh, concerts, which luckily there are some good live shows out there from yeah. when he was still around, and he was a monster player. Yeah, probably yeah. my favorite blues player. Oh yeah, I mean, if you haven't seen the video yet of um on YouTube of his guitar tech swapping his guitar out after he'd broken his high E string, mm, I haven't seen that. Absolutely amazing. I mean, it's like a the smoothest transition, and, and getting a guitar off of a body and putting a guitar on a body is not the most uh, easy thing to do, especially <laughs> if somebody's playing the guitar at that time. You know, right. it's, it's hard enough when you're not playing the guitar, but uh, it's true. Yeah, absolutely amazing. You know, the story I heard about his death was that um, he had arrived to the concert uh, by limo, and he was supposed to return by limo. Mm-hmm. And it was a foggy night and a seat opened up on the helicopter and he decided instead of taking the car back, he'd fly back. It was faster. And, and you know, unfortunately, the helicopter crashed. Right. So it's a real sad story because, I mean, had he taken the limo instead, who knows where his career would have gone? Oh, it's true. It's funny. You know, that's actually pretty similar to Buddy Holly's story because he was in this. Uh, well, back in the day, they didn't have it was the tours were poor. and They played these little dinky rinky dink whatever you know places and um they had a tour bus that didn't have any heat and he got a seat on this airplane and uh and a couple i forget who it was but it was talking to buddy before they took off and uh, he was angry that buddy holly would have a more comfortable ride he says well i hope your airplane falls out of the sky (gasps) and you have to wonder what he felt like after that oh (laughs) i know it's terrible yeah oh my gosh but of course who knew yeah, absolutely. Hey, yeah. Stevie Ray Vaughan, though, just amazing player. Uh, and again, if you haven't heard of Stevie Ray Vaughan, which I'd find it hard to believe you're listening to this podcast and you haven't heard Stevie Ray Vaughan. But if you haven't heard Stevie Ray Vaughan, do yourself a favor and just, you know, check out Pride and Joy, Texas Cold Snap. Blood, Cold Snap. Yeah. yeah. Could have stand the weather. Yeah. Um, and if you like, like the rocking stuff, like when the house is rocking. Yep. Yep. Caught in a crossfire. Awesome. There's a interview in the the recent uh, Guitar World magazine that they had talked to Buddy Guy, and one of the things that Buddy Guy had said about Stevie Ray Vaughan was that um, Stevie Ray always gave credit where credit was due, especially when it came to him playing "Mary Had a Little Lamb," which was a Buddy Guy tune. Mm-hmm. But Buddy Guy had not uh, really take gained the traction that he has now at that point. Right. Uh, and so Stevie would basically always tell people, no, this is a buddy guy tune. This is not my tune. This is, you know, buddy guy recorded this a long time ago. And now, you know, he's bringing it back. Um, apparently from what, uh, buddy guy said in the interview that, um, buddy had gone something like 11 years starting in 1980 without a recording contract. Mm-hmm. And that Stevie Ray Vaughan was doing everything to help him out, you know, along the way, publicizing his music and whatnot during that time. So that's, uh, that's awesome. 
Yeah, I mean, I said something about uh, Stevie Ray Vaughan because he could have really easily said, taken a credit for Mary Had a Little Lamb because really nobody had heard of it. And this is pre-internet, so quite frankly, it was not, you know, nowadays, you, you lie like that, you're going to get called out. Oh, yeah. You definitely. know, because all this stuff's online. But back then, he probably could have gotten away for taking a lot of credit for quite some time. Oh, sure. That's true. Yeah. And he was he was one of those great guys who was a monster player, but but just so humble. Mm. You know, in fact, did he do a uh, like a studio session with Buddy Guy? I think yeah. I saw a video of it. Yeah. 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 I remember that was really good. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. He's one of those guys, too, that won't just take the solos all the time, you know? Right. Which is right. awesome. Okay. Moving on. All right. Yes. I'm, I'm sad now. So I'm going to uh, bring yeah. this back around to the happy. And we're going to uh, mention that on September 3rd, 95 ebay arrived <laughs> and, and eventually gave me pretty much nine tenths of my guitar collection <laughs> i'm so addicted to ebay it's, i have everything i need and i still have to look so uh, what do you want <laughs> i get it you know i mean i look at craigslist for guitars every mm -hmm. day uh and i haven't pulled the trigger on one off and i and i've definitely browsed ebay and i'm still just a little hesitant to do the the online guitar, especially an online used guitar buying experience. Yeah, that's true. But I do know of a really good friend that if I were to strike <laughs> out a little bit, it could probably give me a hand. <laughs> I would, as long as you kept step between me and your wife. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think she'd be kind of upset. Because like, uh, if you ever get, if you get the eBay bug, I don't want to get blamed for <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. The guitar just appeared in my office one day. I have no idea where it came from. <laughs> it leads back to that the theory that if you have enough guitars, then you can't tell when a new one arrives. Oh, yeah. You know, I, think, <laughs> I think you have to get to about 30, though, to hit that. Uh, oh, I'm not even there yet. Yeah. I have to work on it. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's something we can all aspire to. Yeah. Uh, just one more. That's all I need. <laughs> so. That's the answer. How many do you need? Just one more. <laughs> All right. Well, that's been this fortnight in guitar history, and we will uh, bring this segment back um, throughout the uh, year and listen and hear all about what cool things happened in the guitar past. So uh, today's topic, main topic, I guess, of the show is about songwriting. And uh, we thought we'd talk a little bit about things like chord progressions and introductions and all kinds of things, intros and outros and whatever, mm -hmm. all the things that go into mm -hmm. writing a song. And so, Jesse, you uh, went ahead and took some initiative here and you looked up some common chord progressions that would be good to share with uh, our audience. So which one would you like to start with? Sure. Well, probably the, the easiest one to start with is the 12-bar blues because there's uh, so much so, – I mean, there's probably more songs written to a 12-bar blues progression than anything else. Um, and there's probably less variation because the whole idea of a blues song is here's your structure and then vary it. You know, yeah. um, which is really nice because you don't really start with a blank page that way. Right. Um, I know when I started songwriting, it, which was actually the first thing I did. I mean, before I got into you know scales and technique and leads and everything, um, I learned a few chords. This was even before I, I knew bar chords. I started wow. taking the three or four chords that I knew and writing songs. And um, and they were bad. <laughs> <laughs> You know, mostly it was uh, at the time I was listening more to folk stuff and, and 1950s, you know, stuff and and right. uh, so pretty simple stuff. And I had a friend, my best friend had moved away. So they're all like sad, you know, <laughs> right. Kind of, life is terrible. <laughs> Teen angst kind of thing. Yeah. You know, it was all just a cathartic thing um, on three or four chords, you know, um, but it was nice. You know, it was it was an outlet. And so that's that's what I did. Now, the thing is, you have a blank page. What do you do? And I think probably the easiest way is, um, you know, to get started is to copy, <laughs> you know, like you do when you when you learn solos, you start copying licks and scales and then just sort of string them together in your own way. You could um, take a chord progression from a different song, a melody, bits of a melody, start to rearrange them in your own way. Um, or if you have a melody that just comes into your own into your head by itself, figure out what chords fit that. Um, there's a, as many ways to write songs as there are songs, probably. Yeah. So, um, but those are good ways to get started if you don't really have you know 
a foot in the door. And blues, again, is probably the, the easiest way to do that because here you go. Here's the progression. And, right. you know, go through and put your own lyrics to it and then your own solo and you have your own tune. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the variation that you have in the beginning with the 12-bar blues is quick change or not. And right. a quick change is when you go to the four chord on the second bar instead of staying on the, the first chord, uh, right. the one chord. Um, and so, you know, when you're a beginner, uh, especially when I was starting out, it's what I gravitated to because, you know, and if you're playing with somebody else, you know where they're going mm -hmm. and you know what they're going to be playing. And so it's just easy to keep up mm -hmm. uh, as opposed oh, to yeah. some of the maybe more complicated uh, chord progressions out there. Um, and then, you know, of course, probably 90,000 million songs out there have been <laughs> written with sort of the pop rock progressions like the one, four, five or one, right. five, four, yeah. uh, AC, boy. <laughs> yeah. I, you know, and, and, but they're not the only ones guilty of oh, this no. by no, any no. measure. I mean, you, you can go on YouTube and find, you know, if you look up easy guitar songs to play, right. Mm -hmm. And what you're going to find are videos like 25 songs that use these four chords. Right. Or and three. It's like, yeah, or three chords. I'm sorry, three chords. Absolutely. G, C, D, right? And, right. Uh, or whatever. And it's, uh, again, like the 12 bar blues, it's an easy place to start. Yeah, absolutely. You know, uh, if you want some variation, you can throw in the flat six, minor six, yeah, you know, minor six chord, and then have at it. Um, right. It's funny. Um, one of the, one of the things when I first started, um, writing songs actually after i wrote the first dozen that pretty much all sounded the same was gee i have to do something different because these have the same chord progressions as other songs and geez i want to do something different um right. and i hadn't really caught on to the fact that like a ton of songs all use the same chord progression you know <laughs> so i thought oh, i have to do something more complicated so i wrote a couple things that ended up sounding like yes or uh, or don mclean's american pie you know it's a million uh -huh. different chords in that and so right. it's um yeah, it was kind of weird, but really tons of songs use the same basic chord progressions. So um, we talked about the 12 bar blues and the one, four, five, one, five, four. Um, there is a very entertaining one. You can see this link in your show notes, um, a, tw a four chord uh, progression, which is a one, five, six, four. And uh, there's a band called Axis of Awesome. Have you seen this thing? I think I have. I think you sent this to me. Yes. Oh, okay. And basically they go through and it's a little skit where they play a ton of songs that all have the same progression. They go from one song to another with different melodies. And it's a really funny and good illustration that a ton of songs that sound very different, different melodies, different sounds, different, uh, you know, production and everything, but they use the same basic chord progressions, which is cool. Um, and I know another one that, that when I was started, uh, when I just got started was the uh, the 1950s uh, one six four five that you'll hear in um, like songs like O'Donna or Sherry by the uh -huh. Four Seasons, and um, again tons of songs. Uh, these chord progressions, by the way, are all in the show notes. So take a look if you need. Yeah, to and and for our uh, maybe yeah. our listeners who are just starting to think about songwriting chord progressions and whatnot. Uh, I think it's important to uh, point out that if you do look at the 12 bar blues, you're going to want to look online to see the actual progression. So we have the uh, chords written out, the uh, ones that are played, um, but it's uh, there's a 12 bar sort of setup for those. But now how about Jesse for the uh, one, four, five, um, let's say G, C, D. If we say that's a progression, is that play G, C, D, then G, C, D, then G, C, D? Or is there some variation there that one can do? Um, you'll see it both ways. <clears throat> you know, some songs will be the same three chords over and over. Um, mm -hmm. You'll even see like two chord songs, like um, what's that REM song, uh, the one I love or something. It's like two chords. Oh yeah, I think you imagine. Threw the third one later. Yeah, yeah. I think imagine's a two chord song too. Yeah. So you'll see like one four five, one four five, and then they'll change it up. Maybe when they go to the chorus, it'll be something different. Um, but usually, pretty basic. Yeah, yeah. I know uh, "Ball and Chain" by Social Distortion. Uh, mm -hmm. tune the guitar down half step, but then it's basically, uh, D A G D mm -hmm. over and over again. So that's, that's a case where you repeat over and over again. Uh, people play sort of the easy version of that song. That's kind of what you do. Um, so yeah, uh, you know, if you want to write a song, start with your chord progression. Um, think about an intro, uh, and think about an outro, think about a solo, but I think the core 
to, the easiest part to tackle really is that chord progression. Right. Especially for guitar players, it seems. That's where we start. Yeah. I think so. I think every once in a while, you know, someone comes up with a really great lick, you know, you're kind of noodling around one day. It's like, oh, you know, how can I force that into a song somewhere? Right. Uh, <laughs> how can I make a song out of this lick? Uh, and that certainly has happened before. Um, and there's nothing wrong with that either. But I think, you know, for the beginner, getting these chord progressions down will help you not only learn the basic structures of songs, but also help you get those chord changes down. Oh, definitely. As well. You know, yeah, and it's a lot more fun than uh, playing them that way, the practicing your chord progressions that way, than maybe you know just doing G C D, G C D, right, with no context at all. Yeah, yep. and then once you get that down, then I, I mean, certainly it happened for me. You play the chords over and over, and then melodies start coming into your head that might fit over that, and that's certainly a very popular way of, of starting to write. Um, of course, you could also have a melody in your head and then figure out, okay, well, here's what I'm hearing. Maybe you could plink it out on the guitar and then what chords go along with that. Right. Which, and that all gets easier as you learn more and more about theory and what, what notes make up what chords and you know that kind of thing. But certainly right at the outset, you can do it as well. Yeah, we should do some shows. We'll do some shows on theory, uh, different aspects of theory, I think, uh, as, we, as we go forward with the podcast. Uh, I think that'd be good for, to tap into. That way, yeah. we're not necessarily boring our more advanced uh, audience all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Here's a one, four, five. Right, right, right. Mm. But this is of course, you for... can get you know you can get as complicated as you want. Like jazz is often based around like a two, five, one. I mean, that's the basic structure. But boy, they vary it like crazy. Sure. They, of course, they'll change key every other bar. So, <laughs> right. Just to keep it interesting, but yeah. Cool. All right. Well, is there anything else uh, you'd like to add to a uh, songwriting topic? I think that's it for now. We'll, we'll of course, get deeper into it and have different uh, um, ideas about it as we think yeah. about it. <laughs> yeah, I know. This is just the tip of the iceberg. And, and listeners, Definitely. feel free to uh, post a comment on YouTube if you would like to, us to talk about something or if you'd like to contribute to the conversation. Uh, also, uh, feel free to um, send us a message on Twitter. At SST Show, I guess it's tweet us is the proper verb. I don't know. <laughs> um, at, or of course, you can also uh, tweet either me or Jesse. All of those information is there in the show notes. Um, so I guess until next time, boys and girls, just remember keep picking and grinning. Six Strings and Things: A Guitar Adventure is a production of Jester Cat Studios. You can see more about this and all other JesterCat shows at JesterCat.com. You can also email the show at SST at JesterCat.com or continue the conversation on Twitter at SST Show. You can follow Robert at RS Macy, Jesse at Jester700, and Chris at CW Culp. Thanks to Jesse for playing and recording our intro music. 